Your Royal Highness Princess Dina Mered, Your Highness Saida Dr. Mona Binti Fad Al Said, Your Excellency Mrs. Hakobian, Mrs. Guzmao, Honorable Ministers and Distinguished Guests. Salam sejahtera dan selamat pagi diucapkan dan juga selamat datang. A very good morning, everyone, and welcome to this 10th World Cancer Leaders Summit. On behalf of the local hosts, the National Cancer Society of Malaysia, we're very proud and honored for our country to be chosen to host this first summit edition ever in Southeast Asia, and of course, more particularly in Malaysia. My name is Yasmin Yusuf, and I will be your MC for today. The summit theme this year, Cancer Treatment for All, could not be more pertinent given the rise in cancer cases and deaths around the world and the problem of substantial disparities both globally and within countries in access to cancer treatment and care. This summit is a platform dedicated to the voice of the global cancer community in order to showcase what can be done to improve access to cancer treatment for patients around the world. In this summit, we aim to focus on the planning and implementation of the core health services and infrastructure required to successfully diagnose and treat a growing number of cancer patients. Today, we'd like to give you, global health leaders, the opportunity to hear and share your diverse perspectives on how the global cancer community can join forces to design and implement policies and actions for maximum impact. We're honored to count on 350 participants from 70 countries around the world in this 10th edition of the World Cancer Leaders Summit. And it is my pleasure now to call upon our first speaker, the President of the Union for International Cancer Control, Professor Satya Aranda. Good morning, everyone. How fantastic is it to be here in the wonderful city of Kuala Lumpur and to be received by our wonderful um, hosts here in KL. So I'd like to welcome all of you, distinguished guests, colleagues and friends, uh, to this summit focusing on treatment for all. As we've learned this year with the release of new data in, from Globacan, there will be over 18 million new cases of cancer in 2018 and 9.6 million deaths. This region hosts 48% of those cancer cases and an alarming 57% of deaths. So it is truly um, appropriate for us to be here <coughs> in Asia at this time. It's also important to understand that 10% of those cancer cases are lung cancer, accounting for 18% of deaths. And the global uh, issue of tobacco control is being significantly undermined by a range of factors, in including uh, non-combustible devices. And we need to, for a, a renewed effort around tobacco control in all countries. But there are some exciting things in play. We have just had the, th the high-level meeting on NCDs in New York, and this increased emphasis through the three UN meetings on NCDs is bringing great emphasis to prevention of NCDs. And while this is necessary, it is insufficient from a cancer perspective. The missing link for cancer is access to treatment. Cancer treatment around the globe is seen as too expensive and something that countries cannot commit to. Today, we need to dispel that myth. We know that many cancers can be diagnosed early through effective screening programs. Many can be successfully cured when diagnosed. And yet we see this alarming disparity brought to bear yesterday by Her Excellency, the First Lady of Ar Armenia, around children's cancers, where we see some countries with survival up to 90% and others as low as 20%. And, and this is perhaps the starkest inequality that we must uh, address. We also know that ensuring cancer services are available 
is a central pillar of cancer control, whether that's surgery, radiotherapy, or chemotherapy and other medical treatments. Importantly, we have the building blocks that are necessary. We have the cancer resolution that UICC and its partners worked so hard to achieve at last year's World Health Assembly. We have Lancet commissions on access to surgery and radiotherapy. We have WHO essential medicines lists and essential devices and technologies. And these are providing an important framework for universal health coverage for cancer. And we have experiments uh, and programs like the City Cancer Challenge that are helping us to understand how multi-sectorial partnerships can help us address this massive gap in access to cancer treatment. The critical factor though, and one of the key reasons why we're here today, is that advocacy is needed to ensure that these building blocks are brought to bear by all countries. And this is where civil society can play a massive role. They, civil society brings the power of the patient voice to the table, but it can only work if there is a true global initiative and one where our strategy is to speak with a clear and compelling message with a single voice to all governments. We cannot afford to have disparate voices and Treatment for All brings us that collective voice and we'll hear a lot more about that today. But Treatment for All seeks to mobilise civil society in a global campaign to help governments see the benefits of ensuring that the four pillars of the campaign are there, from cancer registration, diagnosis and screening, treatment, and critically, access to palliative care. It will help us articulate the case for investment that will compel governments to not see cancer treatment as a burden, but actually as an investment in the health and wellbeing and social development of each country and it will help us to mobilise communities. More than anything, we need the people to be able to have a voice in understanding and speaking to governments about why these things are essential. UACC stands ready to help. We will assist with the development of the tools and resources that you need in your setting to bring together a multi-sectorial force that will compel the delivery of cancer treatment for all global citizens. We have to end the divide. We will hear today from some great experiences of countries tackling this real problem, but it is through our collective wisdom and our exchange of ideas and our commitment to true global collaboration that we will begin to see the end of this enormous disparity in access to treatment. I look forward to the discussion and uh, really appreciate that you are all here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Aranda. And now it is my honour to introduce the President-elect for the Union for International Cancer Control, UICC, Her Royal Highness Princess Dina Mered. Good morning, everybody. Your Royal Highnesses, Excellencies, colleagues, and friends. 12 months ago, we came together in Mexico City at the 217 World Can Cancer Leaders Summit to consider how cities can take the lead in improving access to equitable, sustainable cancer care in their countries. And we shared with you an exciting new initiative spearheaded by UICC called the City Cancer Challenge. For those of you who might not know, City Cancer Challenge is an initiative established by UICC whereby a CCAN team works alongside city leaders to help move cancer control agenda forward. It is an initiative that is all about implementation on the ground. This is the first time that UICC has put boots on the ground to support cities 
to help them move the cancer agenda forward. Since Mexico, we have seen tremendous progress across our four cities. Asuncion in Paraguay, Cali in Colombia, Humasi in Ghana, and Yangon in Myanmar. A thousand health professionals and 800 patients have been directly involved in the assessment of cancer care services in the cities and in identifying key priorities for strengthening quality cancer care. Just imagine that. For the first time, a thousand health professionals were involved in filling the gap analysis for a city. Never been done before. Over 50 public and private partner organizations have been mobilized to deliver technical assistance and capacity building to the cities. Again, first time, never been done before, that everybody together working on one plan. That is the secret of City Cancer Challenge. We have learned how to accelerate progress and are translating these learnings into action in our new challenge cities, Kigali in Rwanda, Porto Alegre in Brazil, and Tbilisi in Georgia. I have had the honor to visit the very cities that took up the challenge, Cali and Asuncion. What I saw was nothing short of a miracle. I saw magic unfolding before my very eyes. Stakeholders from all sectors, private, government, NGOs, patient groups, all sitting together for the first time. And I kid you not, they were sitting together for the first time. They actually knew me more than they knew themselves. Talking and challenging each other on a shared vis vision of equitable, quality, and sustainable care. Throughout my meetings with presidents, national ministers of health, and all the key people driving change in the cities, I felt the strong, palpable political commitment needed to drive the change that they seek. These incredible achievements have been made possible by UICC's leadership and a committed and passionate team and a motivated and supportive group of partners. What has happened since then that the demand for the CCAN operating model was so popular. It was, the demand became so great that it now needed a more focused group to give it the attention it requires it for scale up. So now, it is the time for us as UICC to pass on the challenge to a new board that will get, drive a new entity, the City Cancer Challenge Foundation. And for those who know how much I love the City Cancer Challenge initiative, because I believe in it so much, it's, it's hard to pass it on. But it must, because you really need a new foundation to give it the focus it needs. But of course, UICC will be there to support along the way, the new uh, board. I am honored to introduce you to the new board of directors that will take up office in January 2019, led by a respected leader in global health. Our, our very own UICC President, Professor Sanchia Aranda. I know that some of you here in the room today, and I invite you to please stand so we can give you all, all the new board of directors. Where is the slide with the new board of directors? There's supposed to be a slide here. No, no slide? Okay. Well, those of you who know, you are the new board of directors. Please stand so we can give you all a well-deserved round of applause. Please stand up. Thank you. As we transition into a new entity, we are also entering a new phase of the challenge with an ambition to scale up support to a wider network of cities, starting with this region. Today, I am pleased to announce a call for applications for cities with populations above 1 million in Asia, inviting them to join the initiative as a challenge city and be supported over two years to design, implement sustainable cancer care solutions. This is a critical opportunity for our members in the region to translate global cancer commitments 
into action. This is an opportunity not to be missed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Royal Highness, for that very um, positive and hopeful message. Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is Dr. Princess Mpemba Simalela. She's the Assistant Director General for Family, Women, Children, and, Ado and Adolescents at the World Health Organization. She's from South Africa and most recently served as Special Advisor to the Vice President of the Republic of South Africa on Social Policy. Please welcome Dr. Princess Natemba Simalela. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Your Excellencies, Sanchia Aranda, President of UICC, Princess Dina Mired, who has now become my partner in crime. I'm honored and humbled to be part of what you stand for. Honorable Min Ministers, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure for me to address the World Cancer Leaders Summit here today. I speak on behalf of the Director General of the WHO, Dr. Tedros, who apologizes for not being able to attend this important event. Dr. Tedros is presiding over the conference of the parties to the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control in Geneva, a topic which is clearly of high priority to this community. I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers for hosting this summit and for inviting WHO to serve as a partner alongside the government of Malaysia and many other institutions, the National Cancer Society of Malaysia and many of the groups that you represent here today. This is my first opportunity to attend this Leaders' Summit. It is also the first time that I've had the opportunity to be among what my president in South Africa would call the brain's trust of the world on cancer. It's an especially poignant moment for me, and I will tell you why in a few minutes. As many of you know, we opened this summit on the heels of the third United Nations high-level meeting in New York. After years of activism, political commitments, and grassroots change, we are seeing a slow, a very slow convergence of forces that is, that is amplifying our voice and our action. Yesterday, during the cocktail, Princess shared with me that her speech that she wrote nine years ago still held a few days ago in New York. That must say something to us as a people, as humanity, that it's taking us so long to reach the poorest of the poor. We've put men on the moon. We've done so many incredible things as humankind, and yet more and more people continue to suffer. They suffer only because they are unlucky to be born in places where there is nothing for them. And this is something that must make us angry. It must make us impatient. And we need, therefore, to accelerate action. At this current pace, we will never reach the Sustainable Development Goals. We must be upfront about that. We therefore need to think about new ways of doing things. And many of you in, these, in this room today are now as skeptical about high-level meetings. I myself used to be. I used to call them jamborees because I often never understood why we had to all come together to tell each other how nice we were when, in fact, the rest of the world was suffering. But the history of some of the things that we have had to live with in developing countries has convinced me of the importance of political leadership. I digress to share with you why this moment is poignant. I come from a country where, because of the color of my skin, I was denied access, even the right to be. We triumphed over too many things. And luckily, I call it divine intervention. I was born 
in a family that believed in education. And my parents gave up everything to make sure that I got studies and I got an education. And in apartheid South Africa, I was able to triumph through sexism, racism, gender-based violence, and everything else to be able to stand here today, not because I'm better, but because I believe truly deep down in my heart that somewhere, somewhere in my life, I was meant to be the voice. I was meant to represent many who are unable to speak for themselves. It is a unique moment because indeed 10, year, 10 months ago, I didn't know that Dr. Tedros would ask me to come and be one of the team leaders. I was busy with other things. You know how South Africa has suffered from an incredible burden of HIV. So I had watched, even as a young obstetrician, women die as they became infected with HIV. I also watched, as a young gynecologist, women dying of advanced cervical cancer in the hospital where I worked in a rural village in South Africa where there was nothing for them. I remember that ward stuck at the corner of the hospital corridor. It was a ward of death. There was a smell that was unbearable, but there was a group of nurses there who were committed, who worked very hard to make sure that those women died, even if it was a, not a painless death, it was a death of dignity. And therefore today, what for me is a convergence is that you are in this room as the brains trust of the world. But I challenge you to think a little bit beyond the confines of that speciality, to think about humanity in its entirety. I think there is no hierarchy in pain. I don't believe there is hierarchy even in death. So as you prevent those who've got cancer from dying, you also need to remember about those who die from other diseases and also make it your rule, your role and your business to be advocates not just for treatment to all, for all, but just advocates for social justice. That we are bound together inextricably as human beings. It doesn't matter where we come from. It doesn't matter where, what we look like. It doesn't matter whether we are educated or not. And I know that the collective wisdom in this room is committed to that. But I'm just saying that I need you to be a bit more angry. I need you to be a bit more impatient. I need you to be a bit more vocal. I often am challenged because I come from that part of the world where leadership often is not taking responsibility. And I veer from my speech here and I hope my DG doesn't fire me because I'm supposed to be an international diplomat. <laughs> but that doesn't work when you know that the truth is different. And therefore, I want to ask us all to say that in those spaces where we can make a difference, make that difference, but take just that extra step and be a little bit brave and speak about things that you don't completely understand. I can't claim I know everything about what you do, but at least I know that your quest is for a better humanity. The convergence here is of a group of people from all walks of life that I have come to respect. Before, I used to think, because I come from a developing country, I have a right to be angry. I have a right to demand things from people. But I've learned, I've learned, even in that Yunga last week, sitting next to somebody in a panel, Princess Dina, it was a panel on innovation. And this man is an entrepreneur. And he spoke after somebody from Kenya spoke about innovation in their country, how Kenya was trying to provide universal access and treatment to all its people. And it was about innovation, it was about technology and all these things. And this man said, well, I'm an entrepreneur and I'm an investor. And where I come from, I need return on my investment. Uh, people like me, we're not preoccupied about investing in the health of Africans. Because even if you showed me the world map, I wouldn't be able to tell you where Kenya is. For a moment, that part of me that's an activist wanted to react. But I remembered that I was wearing my international diplomatic hat. <laughs> and in fact, instead of being angry, 
I actually thought, perhaps he is right. Maybe the person who should be sitting on my chair at that point should have been a head of state from one of the countries of the region that is worst affected, which is Africa. Maybe at that point, that head of state would have thought differently about how we make choices. So therefore, in your roles as leaders, as you interact with the leaders of the continents, challenge them to put money in the right things. Even as they prioritize, they can't prioritize building a stadium just because they've won a bid to host something, uh, soccer, whatever it is, these things that they do in these countries, like our country won the World Cup and we spent millions on, on stadia that's then empty today, and yet people don't have care. Challenge them. I think you do have that right. There is nothing that divides us. There is nothing that stops us from speaking the truth. And therefore, I want to close by saying, I am still speaking on behalf of the WHO. I'm still speaking on behalf of my Director General and the institution that is supposed to bring together the science, the research, the evidence, the technology, the innovation, all of the products that you produce, all of the work that you do, and place it in front of member states and people that make decisions about who should live and who should actually die prematurely. And therefore, your work is so important to, uh, to the agenda of WHO. We've got two initiatives, which we did not choose because they are a nice to do. We chose because they speak to what we all stand for. One is the elimination of cervical cancer. When the Director General made his call to action, which is a call that I plead with you to join, everybody thought this is not doable. Well, when HIV hit Sub-Saharan Africa, somebody said, well, Africans, they can't read the time, so they won't be able to take drugs. Look at where we are today. Increasing life expectancy, and yet, even as women live longer on that continent, a lot of them are still dying from cervical cancer. So I am a passionate fighter for those women who survive the odds that even as they survive and live with HIV, they must not die from this cancer that all of you in this room know can be prevented, can be screened for and treated early, and that in the end, women can live. So I plead with you that if you are an advocate for HIV, for HPV, for cancer, of any part of the body, be an advocate for the entire human body, especially the bodies of women and young girls. When they come into the clinic, they don't look for UICC or WHO or anyone else. They just come in and they seek help. So let us not pre be preoccupied with our logos. Let us be preoccupied with that soul, that spirit, that one little human being, be it a boy, a girl, a man, or a woman who's just there. I'm brought up Catholic, so I always believe that nurses, doctors, and all of you in this room who understand the human body represent the divine intervention. I wish you well in your deliberations. I hope that whatever you do continues to bring hope, to bring energy, to inspire, and to give more life to those that are not as fortunate as all of us are here to have the things that we have, to have the choices that we have. But I know by giving up your time, you have already given up much more. Let us work together to create a better humanity, to bequeath to our children and grandchildren a world that is much better than the world that we currently live in today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Princess Nono Simonella, for that very... Um, inspiring, passionate, and very frank and honest speech. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to welcome now Dr. Freddie Bray, the head of the Cancer Surveillance Section of the International Agency for Research on Cancer, IARC. Dr. Freddie Bray.
your Royal Highnesses, distinguished colleagues and friends, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you so much to, to Carrie and UICC for letting the, the data be up here at the front. I'm going to give you some slides. I hope the slides will, will come up. But I, I wanted to perhaps just share with you some sobering and, and compelling statistics on, on where we are in terms of what the cancer surveillance data tell us. And I want to talk more about the, the availability of surveillance data. And this really fits nicely with the, what we're discussing today. How are we going to possibly further support the implementation of cancer plans to mobilize resources to be able to plan and, um, the, the, the care of, of an increasing number of cancer patients? How are we going to do this? We need the data. We need the data in country and not just the estimates. So I hope to speak on those two topics if my slides come up, which they are not. <laughs> this is always a challenge because I'm meant to be showing uh, global statistics. Okay, thank you. So what's, what is the global picture on surveillance? So just a couple things. Do we know what's around the corner? Yes, we do know what's around the corner. We know exactly what is coming. A lot of it's actually here. So three, three things I just want to try and show you and bear with me. Just the increasing cancer burden. Dr. Aranda's already mentioned uh, the burden of cancer today. Of course it's going to increase, and I want to speak to that. There's critical evidence also now that cancer will be the leading cause of premature death in this century in every country of the world, and I want to show you some statistics on that, and that's driven by epidemiologic mortality, demographic, and cancer transitions. And lastly, and perhaps a more politically nuanced, I just wanted to say something about the SDG target 3.4 in the context of cancer and, and whether targets are being met. Now I'm going to talk briefly on the cancer data, and it is part of the solution. We know there are major gaps, and but I want to give a, a positive spin to that because a lot of work going on trying to, to make the data count. Okay, so as stated, and, and Dr. Vidopas mentioned uh, yesterday in her, her delivery of a, a, a dinner speech, uh, the global can data is it's incredibly important data, the, these estimates. Um, so we, we estimate 18.1 million new cases in 2018 worldwide. But we know if rates stay the same, and the rates aren't going to stay the same in every country, we know that, but if they were, just the, the sheer extent to which demographics are taking hold, rapid changes in fertility, high rates of fertility coming down, increasing life expectancy, it drives population aging and population growth. So we expect almost 30 million cases by 2040 if the rates stay the same. Well, this is a depressing statistic in many ways, but it also should be a, a spur to action. We need to, to act now and we can avert many cases and deaths in the near future. This is the Human Development Index, and I just want to use this. This is a very good uh, marker of uh, epidemiologic and cancer, and, and, and indeed, as I'll show in a moment, demographic transitions. I think you know what it is. It's, it's from the U United Nations Development Program, but it's not just about income. It's also about education and life expectancy, so it actually embraces what do countries actually do, what are the choices they make beyond just income. And there's a four-level categories we can use, very high, high, medium, and low, to, to sort of give some indication of where countries are with respect to societal and economic development. It's a marker, and there's many variabilities, of course, within those countries. But we know when we look at those projections that I've just showed, the biggest increases in relative terms are going to be the countries with the, the lowest levels of social and economic development, where the, the health systems are the most rudimentary, the biggest challenges are going to be faced by those countries in terms of the increasing cancer burden. So a, a doubling of the cancer burden is projected in, in the low HDI countries, those orange countries you saw in the map. And you know it's going to vary a lot. Medium HDI includes India. The, the, the high HDI now includes China. Very big burden. But the, the relative projection suggests that the biggest increases are going to be in the countries at the present time, um, really, that can't afford these, these increasing number of cancer patients to deal with. So another sobering statistic. On to this principle that cancer will become the leading cause of premature death in, 
in this century. This is just ranking um, cancer in terms of premature mortality. So the dark blue is where cancer now is the leading cause of death on the ages under 70. The light blue is its second, the orange is third and fourth. The, the dark red is, is fifth to tenth. That's, that's where cancer ranks. And you can see quite clearly that uh, we are in a transition phase and many countries are transitioning away from infection diseases to NCDs and within NCDs from cardiovascular disease to, to cancer. And I'll try and illustrate that in a moment. But a lot of variability in countries, and this is just two perhaps extreme examples. Japan now has 45% of its um, burden related to malignant neoplasms in terms of premature death. It's about that proportion for South Africa, but it's actually infectious and parasitic diseases and cancers third and lots of variabilities in between in different countries. But it's a matter of transition and socioeconomic changes will, will change that, that profile over the next decades. It looks very much like the Human Development Index actually where countries actually rank. So bear with me, I'm going to try and show you some moving numbers here. This is a leading cause of premature death in, in year 2000. Now the, the red balls, that is cardiovascular disease. So on, on the left-hand side, these are 10 medium-high HDI countries. You can see the red balls, there's a lot more variability. This is the risk of death at the, before the age of 70 of cardiovascular disease versus cancer. These are the blue balls. A lot of variability in cardiovascular disease death, the risk of it. In every country on the left-hand side, this is the medium or high HDI countries, it's higher than cancer, right? You see that? Cancer varies a little bit less, but it's, it's, the blue balls are always lower than the red balls. The other way around, when you go onto the right-hand side, you see the very high HDI countries. Actually, cardiovascular disease has gone down below, below cancer. So this is, this is a paradigm we, we, we're in. Cardiovascular disease is coming down. And, and cancer is also coming down, as we'll see now. So just to, just to note, less variability in, in, the, in the, the very high HDI countries. But this is just a 15-year projection. You see how the red balls cardiovascular disease coming down pretty much much more rapidly in the medium high HDI countries. Not always gone below cancer just yet, but it's getting there. And, it, and because we'll be able to, we're able to prevent and treat cardiovascular disease, um, there's many, many breakthroughs, cigarette smoking prevalence coming down, of course, you know, use of stents, statins, and so forth. It's coming down. Cancer's coming down too, particularly in the high-income countries. So you see in the very high HDI countries on the right, lots of progress in different, different cancers in terms of treatment. Some, some problems, of course, with, with tobacco control and the increases in, in, in particularly among women still in, in lung cancer and so forth. But... You can see that cardiovascular disease is coming down. It's already much lower in, in the high-income countries, and it will become lower than cancer in the, in the countries in transition. So it's just a, a matter of time. And just on the targets, so these are the, just the countries I showed on the right-hand side. Will they meet the target for cancer? Now, I know that this is the NCD target. It's a one-third reduction by, by 2030. But for cancer, will these high-income countries meet the target? Well, they're, they're almost there already in terms of that 30% reduction. At least some of those, those countries are um, they're, they're well on the way to, to reaching that target. So this is, this is a, in some senses, a, a challenge. When we talk about data, Dr. Margaret Chan always talked about what, what gets measured gets done. For, for targets, it's really what gets done gets, gets measured. So we know these targets are going to be met in, the, in the, these high-income countries. So these are 20, 25% declines in absolute terms over those 15 years. That's about 2% per annum declines in the, in the best of circumstances in Norway and New Zealand. But if you look, just focus on the, the right-hand side, this is the mortality projections alongside the incidence on the, on the left. Even with a 2% decline, and I think Dr. Weil will talk about this again in his, his closing address, even if we are getting a, a decline in the in the, the predictions, in terms of the rates, we're still going to see the same number of patients, possibly the same number of deaths. Now, we can do many things to avert many cases and deaths, but it is a, a challenge to know that we're going to have an increasing mortality and incidence burden in the next decades to come. And this is just showing you what will happen in medium-high HDI 
countries, it's more mixed, some amazing progress in, in some countries, such as Kazakhstan, very high rates of cancer and cardiovascular disease, and they, they're making big progress, but it's, it's very variable, as, as you would expect. So what about the cancer data itself? So I, I focus mainly on, on mortality data there, but where are the gaps and the, and the solutions? Well, Dr. Weil will give the, the keynote on global can. It's really been, uh, it is an, imp an important tool for looking at global and regional cancer agendas. It tells us about the extraordinary diversity of the scale and profile of cancer. And we've developed this on the Global Cancer Observatory. But these are estimates. These are estimates in, in many countries. And sometimes we don't know what is going on in, in, in certain countries. And we really have to guess using, using models. And there is a... I think the beginnings of a, of a, if not a backlash, a concern that there is a lot of investment in estimates. And this was a, a, an interesting viewpoint from uh, some colleagues that was in, in the Lancet a couple of weeks ago. You know, we are, we are able to, to do these estimates with very complex models and there's a lot of investment in those, but what are we actually doing in country to support capacity? So their recommendation is rather than in just in investing in global estimates, we really do need to actually put international support towards low-medium income countries to develop their own knowledge and sustain data to, to enable them to, the countries, your countries, to plan your activities. So the global can estimates are estimates, but what we try and do is, is it's a duality where we actually try and convert the data or the, the medical records here in Nepal to to cancer registry systems here in Umbilicae and uh, in India and make estimates. But this way it's a win-win situation. We get better estimates, but we also are able to, to provide the data so that countries can be responsible for their own surveillance and, and cancer plans. And that's, that's critical. Everything in its place, and there is a, you know, a very simple schematic for, for cancer surveillance that runs across prevention through to to end of life care and different subgroups whereby we can, we can assess surveillance and the, and the impact of specific inter, interventions across healthy through to people dying with cancer. So we know risk factor data, there's a step survey in 120 countries are reporting the risk factor data, there's 111 country reports on the, on the WHO website. I'll talk briefly on incidence and survival, these are the key measures that population-based cancer registries can, can develop, stratified by cancer type and stage, and the mortality data, well, that's, that's absolutely key, um, but only about one in four countries can, has high quality data at the moment. If we just focus on, on Africa, and you can see on the right-hand side, this is the, the mortality picture. This is sometimes called the scandal of invisibility, um, really a, a lack of information thus far in, in terms of uh, mortality. But I want to be positive, and there's a lot of good work going on. Bloomberg and the Australian government, CDC, are, are trying to develop in 20 partner countries civil and vital registration systems, improving the risk factor data and trying to, to use that data to, to impact on public health policy. That's a great project. It includes six countries within Africa. For the registry data, I think there's a lot of work going on, and I want to just highlight that there is incredible data coming through. The African Cancer Registry Network were able to supply 30 registry data sets in 25 countries to GlobalCAN to improve the estimates. But more importantly, this data can be used to actually support the evaluation of cancer planning in due time. And we developed a global initiative. These are my last slides. Just really trying to ch change the, the paradigm for cancer data. So we want to increase the number of high quality registries to inform cancer control. We have uh, a capacity building exercise and developed a, a set of interconnected regional hubs in the last uh, eight years. So this was an initiative from Dr. Wild. Really, we're trying to push through and, and, and make this, this happen where we have 25 high quality registries in the next five to 10 years that don't exist now. And it's, it's about regional hubs. It's about training. We've done 80 training courses. We've done about 60 site visits. It's really trying to improve what is happening on the ground using a coordinated model of support. This is the current situation. And in terms of what we're trying to do, we want country leadership. The sustainability angle means we need to 
ensure that the, we have partner countries. We're developing this leadership with, with 20 partner countries at the moment. We need to have this regional focus in terms of training, advocacy for the cause of cancer registries, developing a new set of trainers. And of course, it's a global coordination exercise. Our agency, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, is coordinating this. Um, but there are many, many partners that are a part of this. And we're looking at a scalable budget of, of, of over five years, 15 million. So it's not a lot of money in global terms, but it's, it's absolutely necessary to, to support cancer cancer plans, and we're developing survival data too, but I'll not dwell on that. So that's, that's all I want to say. I just want to thank the, the, the partners of the Global Initiative for Cancer Registry Development, and just end with uh, um, Princess Nono talked about the Cervical Cancer Elimination Initiative, which is excellent, but just the Uganda Cancer Registry, developed in 1991. It's interesting because the modelers for cervical cancer are trying to understand how the elimination is going to work in terms of HPV vaccine plus screening over the next 90, 100 years. If you look at the trends in Uganda, they're astonishing. The, the cervical cancer incidence is increasing. Uganda and Zimbabwe are the only registries with high quality data over time in the whole of sub-Saharan Africa. And they, there are increases of 3% per, per year in both, both uh, subpopulations. But the registry itself is actually run on a budget of between five and $10,000 per year. These are the three staff. They're, they're funded by Makarera University. It's in a very perilous state, and you just wonder why is, why is this the case, because these are the drivers of very important information on cervical cancer control, and indeed for cancer control generally, but yet the, the registries are in a, in a very difficult situation. So we hope we can transform this through investments in countries themselves, because ultimately, when we talk about social and economic development, it shouldn't, registries and, and surveillance generally shouldn't just be the product of development, it should actually be the driver of them as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Freddie Bray, Head of Cancer Surveillance Section at the International Agency for Research on Cancer for that um, very clear picture of the global landscape of cancer surveillance. Your Highness, ladies and gentlemen, I am now going to leave you in the good hands of Mr. Charles Goddard, the Editorial Director of the Economist Intelligence Unit, who's going to be the moderator for today's sessions. He'll be conducting two interviews, a panel discussion, and there'll be an interactive session with the audience as well. Mr. Goddard. Thank you, Yasmin. Thank you so much. Good morning, uh, Your Highnesses, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's uh, lovely to be here. I've got to get used to this multi-directional stage um, and make sure I look all around. But it's absolutely wonderful to be here. I'm delighted uh, because one of the things that I do um, at the Economist Intelligence Unit is to run our uh, global cancer programs, uh, which include a, a series of uh, reports and research as well as events uh, around cancer. Um, and indeed premised on the basic uh, idea that uh, The Economist is really focused around bringing the tools of economics to these pressing global public policy issues, of which cancer, of course, is one. And let me just say that um, I'm uh, absolutely privileged, uh, I feel absolutely privileged and delighted, really, because uh, our partnership with UICC has been enormously important uh, to build the energy and drive uh, much of what we've been doing. So a warm thanks uh, to UICC uh, for all of the wonderful uh, work that it's been doing. Um, let me in bring up to the stage immediately, since we are running a little bit, but bring up to the stage immediately Dr. Uh, Al, Al Abelardo Meneses, um, who is the Director General for the National Cancer Institute of, get the, get the direction right, the National Cancer Institute of Mexico. Welcome. I think it's really uh, an excellent place for us to start um, with Mexico, because of course the last um, World Cancer Leaders Congress, or summit rather, was in Mexico. And one of the outcomes of that summit, uh, I think one of the excellent outcomes of that summit was the fact that the National Cancer Control Program in Mexico uh, got up and running, and it started. I think, you know, for the benefit of everybody here, I think it would be really interesting, first of all, just to try and understand how that process got underway and how you managed to bring it to a conclusion, particularly at the World Cancer Leaders Summit. How did that happen?
Thank you. Well, uh, let me go a little back. Uh, 30 years ago, we tried to implement a operational uh, based cancer registry in our country. And 10 years looking for a national cancer control plan in Mexico. Uh, it was not possible to get both. Uh, four years ago, when we were in Melbourne, in the World Congre uh, Cancer Congress, Dr. Laura Sochin and I saw that just uh, three or four percent of, uh, of the attendants were from Latin America. Um, few people from Mexico. And we saw that the developed countries who have success controlling the problem about cancer were that countries who had a national cancer control plan. For that reason, we start to look the ways to get a, a national control plan. Um, we try to have the uh, headquarters in our country or in our region in Latin America. Uh, four years ago, uh, we opened a new tower, medical tower in our uh, institute, and I invited to the president to open in the the ceremony, and I told him that it was necessary to have a, a national control plan in our country, because he told me, uh, you are very, you must be very proud about this uh, new tower, because it's a big, uh, huge uh, building. And I told her, told him, no, uh, because we just covered 6% of, uh, of the patients who can, who with, uh, with cancer. And uh, he told me, what, what do you need? Uh, our country needs a national control, control plan because uh, we need to cover all the population with uh, this disease. And in that moment, he gave the instruction to work in this sense. Uh, trying to implement the National Cancer Control Plan and the Oblational Base Cancer Registry. Can I just ask you, was it helpful, I mean, and, 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 you know, in a sense, I'm trying to sort of position the World Cancer Leaders Summit here as part of the, uh, as part of the solution. You, you started talking about this at a Cancer Leaders Summit, and here you managed last year to get the Cancer Control Program directly after the summit, get it approved. How important is it to have that pressure, do you think, from uh, outside and from a wide group of stakeholders to try and drive uh, the government to take action around this kind of policies? Well, I, I, I saw that uh, if you put in the uh, presidential agenda the, this uh, point, it will be possible to, to get this kind of uh, programs. Uh, we look for the summit in our country. Uh, we start to invite him the Minister of Health, the senators, the deputies, mm. the civil society, society uh, organizations, and different Minister of Health from the uh, states in Mexico, trying to involve uh, with this uh, project. Mm. And immediately we start to give some uh, lectures, or programs in the media in the journalists, and um, all the country were involved with this topic. In that moment when we uh, were uh, assigned to have the headquarters by this uh, summit in the last year, uh, immediately our government involved in this project. So the sense that, you know, without that multi-sectoral approach, it would have been yes. much, much more difficult to get the momentum to build uh, for a national cancer control program. How, how much consultation then went on between yourselves as the National Cancer Institute and the rest, uh, the rest of these stakeholders to build the cancer control program itself? Well, you, you need to be inclusive. 
Uh, you know that our uh, country has a, a fragment system. We have uh, uh, half of the population with insurance, and uh, half of our population without. Uh, you need to invite to participate in this to people from the IMS, ISTE, Emex, uh, uh, private sectors, uh, armed forces, all uh, people who are uh, with insurance. But uh, if you invite all of them to participate in this uh, program, it's more uh, easy mm -hmm. to get this kind of uh, projects mm -hmm. because uh, during all these uh, decades, all they were rejected mm -hmm. because if the project is just for one institute, they don't accept uh, to participate. But if you involve since the president to all the organization, it's easy to, to get these uh, projects. I think that um, so one of the challenges well, let, let, first of all, let's, let's talk a little bit about the year since it came into force and it was approved. How, how do you feel things have gone in the first year of the implementation of the cancer program? Well, uh, what, what, what has been your first set of objectives during this, um, this early stage of the implementation? Well, uh, at the beginning, when we involved these uh, all sectors, we start to work in uh, prevention, uh, look, looking for uh, diminish the risk factors, and to uh, make the, the a book about the cancer national cancer control plan, uh, trying to uh, involve prevention, early diagnosis, treatment, uh, rehabilitation palliative care, uh, financing, and research. You, uh, um, Freddie Bray was talking earlier about the, the absolutely Im the central importance of having uh, really strong data to be able to make policy. And I know that prior to the um, approval of the National Cancer Program in Mexico, there wasn't really a strong population registry. How, how have you started to build that? Because I know that's one of being the priorities of the NCCP, isn't it? Uh, building the data. What? Building the national registry, the cancer registry. Well, well uh, at the same time, when we uh, start to work in this uh, national cancer control plan, we start to implement the operational based cancer registry. Uh, Dr. Moore, who is the coordinator of this uh, program, start to look for uh, cities with more than one million of population and to implement uh, this in cities who which have uh, support of oncologists and all the uh, the government the, the local government were, were involved in this uh, project local uh, from the cities and now we have uh, five cities uh, participating in this uh, re 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 poblacional based cancer registry. Have you had uh, the help of outside parties like universities and academia to help you build these registries? Or how have you gone about sort of accelerating the process of building the registries? Well, we, we need to talk with the governments, local governments, at the beginning because we need to involve them to this uh, program, talking with, with the governors from the states, uh, with the leaders of uh, cancer, uh, with board from the institutes, and besides with the civil, civil society organization, because we need to work with all these networks in order to facilitate this uh, labor. I think it's really fascinating, isn't it? Because as you mentioned earlier, the fragmented nature of the healthcare system in Mexico creates a set of challenges around building the network that's necessary to, to implement a, yeah, a complex uh, plan. Uh, most of the institutions wants to leader mm. this kind of project, 
but it's difficult if you have a fragmented system. For that reason, you need to, to put in the agenda of all of them this uh, topic as a principal problem of health public in, in our country. So this is, a, I think, a the, set of... The third house of death. Uh, cancer. If you were to take, if you were to give, uh, take a few lessons from this process of building the consensus yeah. that's needed, because there are quite a few countries in uh, this room, I'm sure, that have similar kind of fragmented health systems. What, what lessons would you say are really important? Well, you, you need to talk with uh, all the sectors. Uh, uh, you need to give much information about the problem, because if they understand this. Uh, this uh, health problem is difficult that they involve or collaborate. For that reason, you need to make much uh, forms trying to convince uh, about this uh, health problem. Talking with, uh, since the president, the minister of health, civil societies, and leaders of opinion in our states and country. How, how important was it that the president himself actually got behind this process? Do you think that was a really important point of turning point for the... Well, if you have a fragmented system, uh, it's difficult for any minister of health to pressure because each one of them believe that they have the power. Mm. For that reason, when the World Cancer Leader Summit was given up, given up uh, I tried that the president of our country were involved because in that uh, moment, he invited to all these sectors to participate in this. And besides, we had the presence of the uh, first ladies, uh, some presidents like Tabaré Vázquez from Uruguay, Peña Nieto from Mexico, the First Lady, uh, Princess Dina Miret, Sancharanda, mm. uh, the head of the, our government from Mexico City, uh, some minister of health from the different states, and all of them with their presence were more easy for us to implement this. Uh, I think that's, an, sorry. I think it's an enormously important lesson, isn't it? The sort of building the coalition of leaders that are going to get behind something like this is fundamental. Uh, and it's an experience in many other uh, in countries that have succeeded in this process as well. Can I just ask you, the, in Mexico, we, we did a, a, a cancer control um, scorecard of Latin America, of 12 countries in Latin America. Mexico came fourth out of the 12 countries that we looked at, and I think it scored very well on prevention and early detection. Um, it didn't score particularly well around financing um, and radiotherapy, but let's just talk a little bit about financing, both from the point of view of the access, um, in other words, the, the, the access, the affordability of being able to get people to come and Take, a, take advantage of the services that you're now developing, as well as internally within the government, the budgeting process, the, f the extent to which the central government and the state governments are now prepared to finance the National Cancer Control Program. As I told you, half of our population have uh, insurance, social insurance. Uh, half since uh, two... 2014, we have a new program called Seguro Popular. And this uh, program covers uh, some uh, catastrophic diseases, uh, mainly uh, breast, cervical cancer, uh, colon, ovary, testicular, lymphoma, and some bone marrow transplantation. And uh, in total, close to 90% of our population has universal coverage. But the problem is that uh, all of these sectors try the, these diseases 
in different ways. There are budget, there is budget for any sector, for IMS, ISTE, PIMIX, uh, Seguro Popular, but all of them uh, try prevention, early diagnosis, treatment in different ways. For that reason, I am trying to convince them to put all in a national cancer control plan, because if we homologate these uh, topics, this topic with experts, by participating as experts from these uh, different sectors, it's possible to diminish the, the budget, because currently just for uh, innovative drugs, we need to use uh, some uh, projects with the pharmaceutical industry. But, uh, we are successing some diseases as lung cancer, for example. We moved from survival uh, in two years from 15% to 74% using uh, innovators of tyrosine synasa and immunotherapy, for example. But not in all the sectors are giving uh, immunotherapy, immunotherapy, for example. Uh, we are trying to homologate in all the sectors, prevention, early diagnosis, access, access to treatment, survivorship, financing, and uh, research. I'm afraid we have run out of time, but I just want to, first of all, congratulate you on being able to get the National Cancer Control Program up and running, but also uh, thank you for your, your thoughts and your insights around it. Very, um, I, I mean, we do uh, warmly congratulate you on this process. Everybody, please do. Uh, thanks, Dr. Menezes. Thank you. Thank you.